Hi, welcome to Constituent Mailbag. I hope this is the first in a series I do, I do of this in which I actually share with you the substance of some of the hundreds and sometimes thousands of emails and letters I get each week here in the office from people in the 10th Congressional District and share with you the gist of how I am going to respond to them. And today I want to start with Kyler of Yelm who wrote in and was concerned about the health of the Puget Sound and wants to draw particular attention to the safety of the orca population in Washington State. He expressed his appreciation that I introduced a resolution recognizing June 2017 as National Orca Protection Month. I did that last year. Skylar, thanks for the communication. Uh, the orca is an indicator species of the health of the Puget Sound, and the health of the Puget Sound isn't good. Indeed, the orca, the southern resident orca population now has 12 fewer um, members to it than it did when it was listed on the endangered uh, species list. Now that's important to all of us really um, because the truth of the matter is what that means is they're not getting enough to eat and what they eat is salmon. And the reason that there aren't enough salmon to eat is in large part because the quality of the water in the Puget Sound isn't good. The number one leading cause of pollution in America water pollution in America is stormwater runoff. And if you think about it, the Puget Sound is really basically a bathtub. And every time it rains, and Lord knows in western Washington it rains a lot, all that stormwater is washed off into the Puget Sound. And when it does, it kills salmon. And when it kills salmon, it leaves less food stock for the orca. So what I like to say is, uh, you cannot save the orca if you do not save the salmon and you cannot save the salmon if you do not save the Puget Sound, and you cannot save the Puget Sound if you don't do something about stormwater. When I first got to Congress with my roommate and colleague, Congressman Derek Kilmer, we, uh, we formed the Puget Sound Recovery Caucus, and we've been hard at work on this issue ever since. We've advocated, and sometimes successfully, for increased federal funding to support Puget Sound cleanup activities. Uh, we have developed a Puget Sound Day on the Hill in which we bring back all the stakeholders, businesses and tribes and environmental advocates to the nation's capital to advocate for it. This is a, a problem we didn't get into overnight, and it's a problem we're not going to get out of overnight, but if we're going to save the Puget Sound, we simply must, and the orca is one way to think about the importance of doing that, that magnificent animal. Who among us does not have the image of an orca breaching the water and all that it means to who we are. So, Skyler, Kyler, thanks again very much. So, Michael of Olympia is concerned about Russia's influence on the U.S. election system through social media like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And he thinks that these companies should start a campaign to educate citizens on how to spot Rus Russian bots. Michael, I couldn't uh, more strongly share your concern about Russian interference in our elections in 2016 and since, as a matter of fact. The truth of the matter is that as I sit here and speak, Russia is interfering in the U.S. governmental process in any number of ways. They have interfered in the elections in Germany and in France. They are currently interfering in the upcoming national elections in Mexico, and they do so because they're not being held accountable for it. Uh, and they do this in a number of ways, and their use of bots over social media is one way. We've had some very serious conversations with the social media platform companies about the necessity for them to step up and take a more active role, but it's actually broader than that. We also need to harden our election security systems, very considerably harden them, so that there's no means by which Russia can actually interfere either in voter registration or vote tallying for that matter. We have no evidence that they did the latter in 2016, but we know for a fact that they penetrated the voter registration rolls in more than 20 states, and that's very disconcerting. So it's critically important that we approach this uh, in as many ways as is possible. I personally introduced what I call the DISARM Act, which stands for Directing Implementation of Sanctions and uh, uh, Holding Accountable Russian Mischief. Uh, it's a uh, broadly co-sponsored in the House of Representatives, a bipartisan bill, because my, my fundamental belief is until we hold Russia accountable, until there's pain for them to continuing to interfere in our system, they will continue to do it. And so I think it's critically important that we attack this on all fronts. You know, I think about this in the broader 
sense, Michael, of uh, having grown up during the Cold War, that was essentially a contest between the forces of capitalism, the economic ideology associated with capitalism, and that of communism. Uh, we won that, the Cold War, but we're engaged in a new Cold War. And the new Cold War is basically a contest between Western democratic values and the values of autocracy and kleptocracy as practiced by Vladimir Putin and the people of Russia. This is the new great contest in which we're engaged, and it's every bit as important that we win it as it was the previous Cold War because of our commitment to the values of holding free, fair, open elections that are conducted with integrity. Thank you for sharing my concern about this important issue. So finally, Carter of Olympia High School wants to know if you have a central creed that you follow. What current issues you are focused on in Congress? What would you like to change in the world and who your favorite U.S. president was? Well, that's quite a mouthful, Carter. Thank you for your increasing interest in uh, uh, our, our civic affairs and the health of our democracy. So I'm the son of a truck driver and a telephone operator, and I was raised in a family of four children. My, my working class parents were able to buy a home and take vacations, have retirement security, have health care, and send each of us kids to college that wanted to go. And we all knew as we grew up that if we worked hard and played by the rules, we had an opportunity to get ahead. Something happened in this country about 35 years ago where that, that, that sense of upward mobility uh, was arrested. And the truth of the matter is it's reflected in wage stagnation over a long period of time. It's no longer the case that if you work hard and play by the rules, will you necessarily be able to get ahead? Some people can and do, but fewer and fewer people. So when you ask me what really matters to me, what my central creed is, it really gets back to that set of issues and what I want for America, which is that we, that we grow this economy faster, that we grow this economy in a more fair fashion so that prosperity is more broadly shared, and that we grow it in a way that is sustainable, that we're not just eating our seed corn, as my dad used to say, or borrowing against the future. These are the things that matter most to me. Now, you also asked, and I want to answer your question about who my favorite U.S. president is. I'm a walking cliche. I apologize, uh, Carter. I, I don't have an original thought here, but I have an authentic one. I've always most admired our first president, George Washington, but let me tell you why. On at least two occasions, George Washington was, by his peers, offered infinite power. As commander-in-chief at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, he was offered that as a lifetime appointment. He turned it down and returned to the farm. And then, of course, he was elected as the first president. He served two terms and voluntarily gave it up because he believed it was more in keeping with the values of a democratic republic that we periodically elect our leaders. He could have had it. He was indeed at one point offered to be made king. He gave it all up. He gave up power. And when you stop and think about the eternal wisdom of that great Catholic scholar in Great Britain of the 19th century, Lord Acton, who said famously, all power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And George Washington never let that happen to him. It was a shining example that has endured through the ages. And Carter, that's why. George Washington is my favorite president. Thanks for joining me for this very first edition of Constituent Mailbag.